Hey class, hopefully you guys enjoyed the documentary yesterday on King Arthur and um, what he may have been like historically, who he may have been as a person, even if he was not named Arthur, but the person who may have inspired these legends, but more importantly, um, kind of the overview of the legends themselves and a lot of themes and ideas that, um, that those legends wrestle with that are very important to the Middle Ages. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that stuff today, and I'm going to give you kind of an introduction to the more literary side of this as far as the kind of literature that we're dealing with um, and kind of a, an introduction into one of the early authors of Arthurian legend. Um, and um, and then I'm going to be setting you on track to be reading a piece by that author. Um, as we're looking at Arthurian legend, we're not necessarily going to be looking at the story in chronological order, so much as kind of in the order of uh, publication, right? When some of these different stories were written and when they uh, came into medieval society. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you guys got the chance to watch that documentary first so you have kind of a general idea of the overall story um, of, of the Arthurian legend um, and how it kind of traditionally goes so that you can fit these different uh, stories in their proper place since we won't be looking that at them in chronological order. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into a little bit about um, Arthurian romance um, and uh, author Chrétien de Troyes. So we're going to be looking first at one of the early authors of Arthurian romance, uh, Chrétien de Troyes, who uh, is a French author, if you could not tell, um, and wrote several uh, tr kind of traditional romances um, about various characters in the Arthur story. Um, and we're going to kind of look a little bit at his life. We don't know a lot about him, but we're going to look a little bit at his life. And then we're going to talk about um, Arthurian romance um, and the medieval romance in general, which was a fairly new genre when Chrétien de Troyes was writing it. Um, and then um, we're going to look a little bit about Arthurian legend in particular today. Later on in the unit, we'll move on to looking at Sir Thomas Mallory, who's one of the latest medieval writers of Arthurian romance. Um, and he's responsible for kind of compiling all the different stories about Arthur into one cohesive whole, into one book that kind of tells the whole story. Um, but for now, we're going to look at Chrétien de Troyes and some of his works. So, uh, Chrétien de Troyes lived uh, from roughly 1135 to 1190 AD. Um, we're not 100% about those dates, but um, those are the rough estimates of his life. And we're not entirely sure, partly because we just don't know a lot about his life. Most of what we know has been gleaned from his writings, right? Uh, most of what we've been able to put together um, have been gleaned from introductions to his works and the works themselves and his writing style and so forth. Um, his first name, Chrétien, uh, simply means Christian in French. Um, and so it's possible that that might be a pin name and not his actual name. That may just be kind of a denotation of his religion because then his name would simply mean uh, Christian from the city of Troyes. Um, that would be what his name uh, would actually mean. However, it is also possible that Chrétien might be his actual given name. I mean, we know that um, even in English, Christian is a very popular first name. Um, and so um, it's entirely possible that that could be his first name or it might be a pen name of sorts. Um, most likely, based on some of the study that scholars have done, people think that he may have been raised in Brittany, which is a region in northern France um, that is not far from Great Britain or England. Um, and may in fact draw its name from some of the same people groups that used to live in England who migrated across the English Channel into northern France. Uh, this was probably where he picked up 
a lot of the Arthur stories. Um, the Arthur stories do not originate in France, although France uh, is one of the first places to write them down. Um, but the Arthur stories originate from the Celtic peoples who lived in England. One, they are the earliest inhabitants uh, of England that we're aware of. Um, and the Arthur stories come from them originally. Um, but some of the people from England migrated into Brittany in northern France and um, began to tell those stories and the French people began to pick up on them. And the French people transformed them, as you may have heard a little bit in the documentary yesterday, into a more kind of medieval idea um, and added some of their own kind of French twist onto the story. Um, and so it seems likely that Chrétien de Troyes was born and raised in Brittany and may have originally heard the Arthur stories from there. Um, and then um, later when he was writing, uh, later in his career, drew on those Arthur stories for um, some of his original tales. It is important to note that Chrétien de Troyes was not merely recounting stories that he'd heard, though he was inventive and he did um, he did create some new stories that had not been part of the King Arthur legend before, and even some new characters. For instance, the character of Lancelot is a creation of Chrétien de Troyes. He, he came up with that character, and Lancelot is now a very integral part of the Arthur story. He's almost inseparable from it. And so um, that that invention of Chrétien de Troyes uh, is something new. It's not something that was in the Arthur story before, but it has become an inseparable part of it. Um, another aspect that he adds is the search for the Holy Grail. Um, Chrétien de Troyes' uh, Percival is one of the earliest Holy Grail stories that we ever hear, um, this kind of quest for the Holy Grail. And so that's another a traditional aspect of Arthurian legend that Chrétien de Troyes brings to the table. And so he's not merely a copier, um, he's using the world of stories that he's been introduced to, but he's adding his own stories to it. And because these are some of the earliest written stories about Arthur, um, these become just kind of very important parts of the story that later authors will continue to expound upon. Um, so we know that uh, after he was born and raised in Brittany, he later lived in Troyes in the Champagne region of France. Um, and it was there in the Champagne region of France uh, that he worked at the court of Marie de Champagne, um, who was a noble woman who was very well known for sponsoring the arts and for um, for encouraging that to flourish um, under her reign. And so she was kind of an official patron and official sponsor of Chrétien de Troyes. And you will notice, especially in the introduction to Lancelot, the Knight of the Cart, um, that he, um, he kind of re refers to her and her specific request um, for him to write a story um, and, and that this is the story he's kind of produced in response to her request. Um, so that's, that's basically what we know about his biography. We don't know a lot beyond those details um, because nobody's really written a story, an account of Chrétien de Troyes' life. What we've gathered, we've gathered from his works. Um, other things that we've gleaned from his writings include the fact that he seems to have been well-educated. Um, he... Uh, could read and seems to reflect the inspiration of three different cultures. Uh, Latin, which we talked about in the lecture on the medieval era as being kind of the language of the educated during the medieval times. Um, and of course, the language of the Roman Empire prior to the dawning of the medieval era. But he also showed a lot of familiarity with the Provençal culture from southern France and then the Breton culture from northern France. And the Bretons were that group of Celts from England who had migrated across um, the English Channel into northern France and Brittany. 
Um, and so he shows some influence from all three of those regions and that he was probably a well-educated individual. As far as Chrétien de Troyes works, um, he has produced a number of romances based on Breton mythology, which are the stories about Arthur, right? Of course, as we said, he is introducing new elements to these stories, um, but they are based on that and are constructed in that world. Um, we do know that he wrote one particular work, Tristan and Isuit, which has been lost. Although that's a fairly traditional story, there are many, many other authors who have addressed that story. Uh, sometimes it's called Tristan and Isolde. Um, and so that, that story is very common um, and uh, you could read the general tale elsewhere. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly how Chrétien de Troyes told the story because we don't have his copy of it. Um, but we can assume it was probably pretty similar to a lot of the other versions of the story that exist. He also has some romances, Eric and Anita, and Clies. Um, then we get to three of his most popular tales. These are, these are probably the ones that people most often go to. And his tales of three of King Arthur's knights and their various quests. Um, and he kind of, he, he shows us kind of three different um, kinds of knights. Um, and uh, kind of has this gradual, uh, this gradual change from the very worldly quest that the knight could be on to the more holy quest. So Lancelot, the knight of the cart, um, is the, the most worldly of them. Lancelot is a very human figure. He does have redeeming qualities. Um, he has nobility and honor in many different ways. And yet, he does not value his honor as highly as, say, some of the other knights do. Um, as you learned yesterday in the documentary, um, he is, of course, um, adulterous, right? He has an adulterous relationship with King Arthur's queen, which is a very much kind of a conflict of interest, right? How can you proclaim loyalty to the king and yet um, be in a love relationship with his wife, right? This is very problematic. And so Lancelot, Lancelot sacrifices his honor in many ways. He also sacrifices um, his honor as a knight uh, in order to help save Guinevere. And so there is this kind of real problematic knight figure and a worldly knight figure in Lancelot. Yvain, the knight of the lion, um, has uh, he, he takes a slightly different route. And so Chrétien de Troyes shows us um, that not all knights are like Lancelot, right? Some knights are able to make the correct choice. And Yvain's story is a story of choosing his honor and his knightly duty over his love. And so um, that's certainly a very uh, different approach than the one that Lancelot takes. Lancelot certainly chooses his love over his honor and his duty, um, whereas Yvain chooses his honor and duty over his love. Um, and then we get to Percival, um, who goes on the quest for the Holy Grail. Now traditionally, um, Percival does not um, complete that quest. He's not the one who ultimately attains the Holy Grail. Um, and this may be in part because uh, uh, Percival may have been Clotilde de Troyes' last work. Uh, he left it unfinished. Um, and so we assume that he probably passed away before he was able to complete the work. And so Percival does not finish the quest to find the Holy Grail. We don't know if Clotilde de Troyes would have had him uh, find and uh, receive the Holy Grail. Um, but as the Arthurian story traditionally goes, and you learn in the documentary, it's Lancelot's son, Galahad, who proves himself the purest and most worthy of knights and who is able to eventually achieve the Holy Grail and find it um, and, and to receive that. And though he does not bring it back to Arthur's kingdom as Arthur had hoped, 
um, he does kind of reach that epitome of purity and kind of does an Elijah or Enoch kind of move where he just kind of ascends to heaven um, rather than uh, to risk being corrupted by the sin of the world uh, since he's achieved this kind of perfect vision of Christ. Um, and so Percival's quest is not a quest of romantic love. It's a quest of his love for God. And in, in this quest for the Holy Grail, it's not a conflict of interest, right? His love for God also uh, leads him on the quest for the Grail and to his duty for finding the Holy Grail. And so they kind of find a perfect merging between love and duty in a sense of love for God, love for the divine, um, and a sense of duty that drives you onward through that. And so you can see that Chrétien de Troyes experiments with different kinds of knights, right, um, and different kinds of quests and varying degrees of honor and nobility. And there is a kind of commentary on what's the most important thing in medieval society there. Um, obviously, Christianity and faith and the church are very, very important. And so Percival's quest is seen as the highest and most glorious. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Arthurian romance. And in order to do that, we first need to talk about the genre of romance. And as I mentioned a few days ago in the lecture on the medieval era and medieval literature, romance in the medieval term does not mean what we have come to think that it means, right? Typically, when we say romance literature, we mean like a story about a love relationship between a man and a woman, right? That's typically the kind of literature that we think of when we think of romance. There is a relationship between medieval romance and our modern definition, um, but the origin of the term romance is doesn't really have anything to do with what we would call romantic love. So the medieval romance uh, was popularized by a group of poets, uh, French poets known as troubadours, um, and they uh, were traveling singing poets. And they, in the medieval era, uh, this is after Charlemagne um, had kind of helped win peace in Europe and had been crowned Holy Roman Emperor, and there was time for more artistic and cultural endeavors. Uh, these poets began traveling around and singing stories about uh, knights and these gallant knights and their great deeds of chivalry. Um, and so the medieval romance is really a story of knights and chivalry and chivalric duty and the conflicts that may arise from that on their various quests. Many, many of the early medieval romances were quest stories. Later, as the Arthurian legend develops a little bit more, there's a lot of aspects of the Arthurian story that are not about a quest. But most of the early medieval romances, even the ones that didn't necessarily have anything to do with Arthur, were about knights who had journeyed on quests. And Chrétien de Troyes' stories fit very much into that kind of traditional mold. Although they are set in the world of King Arthur, um, they focus more on a particular knight and that particular knight's quest journey. Um, so these stories were popularized by the troubadours and the reason that they're called romances is that they were originally done in Roman influenced languages, meaning languages that were heavily influenced by the Latin of the Roman Empire. And so these Roman influenced languages are what we call today romance languages. Um, so many of these languages are Spanish, French, uh, Italian. These are some of the romance languages. And the earliest medieval romances were done in French, which is a Roman influenced language. But some of them were done in other uh, romance influenced languages. I believe Portuguese is another uh, Roman influence language or romance language. I think I said romance influence language a minute before. Roman influenced or romance. Um, and so that was why they became known as romances, meaning essentially that they were done in the vernacular language and they were not written in Latin. 
right? They were written in the language of the people. They were stories told for the people. Now, they have led to our modern definition of romance because love was often a key plot element in these stories. So romantic love was often something important in the medieval romance. And so because of that, it led to a time in literature later known as the Romantic period, which the medieval period heavily influenced the Romantic period. And the Romantic period um, really wrote a lot about romantic love. It wasn't the only theme that they wrote about, but it was one of the most popular themes. And then kind of going beyond that, uh, because of the influence of the Romantic period in the modern world of literature, it's led to our modern definition of romance having to do with love between a man and a woman. Um, and so uh, that's where our modern definition of romance comes from. But originally, the medieval romance wasn't named the medieval romance because of elements of romantic love. Um, although that is often present, but it's also important to note that it's not always present. But it was originally named simply because of the languages in which these stories were written. So, I told you that the medieval romance are tales of knights and chivalry. And so, let's take a quick time out from our discussion of the medieval romance to mention some things about knights to answer the question, what is a knight? So historically speaking, um, knights were simply members of what we call the cavalry, right? Um, and the cavalry are mounted troops, meaning fighters who ride on horseback. Um, and this originally begins, uh, the knights begin as an important figure in medieval society under uh, the reign of Charles Martel, who was a king of the Franks, and the Franks eventually become the French. Um, and Charles Martel, you may remember from our lecture a couple days ago, uh, was nicknamed the Hammer and was the king who kept the, uh, the Arab uh, Moors who had uh, conquered northern Africa and had come across into Spain. He kept them from invading France and defeated them at the Battle of Tours. One of the things that he noticed at the Battle of Tours was how effective the Arab cavalry were. Um, he noticed how effective uh, the troops that the Arabs had on horseback were against his soldiers. Of course, they won the battle, but he noticed this, and so he decided to form his own, uh, own army of mounted troops. And so he did this within the feudal system that was emerging as a key part of the medieval era. Uh, he granted land to his followers with the express instructions that they were to find a way to support horsemen for battle on their land. Um, and so the followers in turn parceled out pieces of their land. We talked about this, the manors that got parceled out to the knights. Um, and to these, these troops that would ride on horseback. And the knights quickly became one of the key components of medieval society and became a certain level of nobility, uh, a part of the aristocracy in a way. They weren't as highly um, revered as, say, uh, uh, nobles like dukes and duchesses and counts and earls and so forth. But they were a part of the aristocracy and were well respected. Um, part of the qualification to be a knight was that you had to be physically strong. Um, and you had to do that in order to battle from horseback. Obviously, you had to be an experienced horseman. And you had to be tr well trained in the use of all weapons, right? Um, uh, knights also often had to build their own weapons, uh, know how to repair their weapons, um, maintain their armor, and all these sorts of things. Um, so being a knight was quite a bit of work. Um, there, there was a lot of training that went into that. You had to decide that you were going to pursue the path to knighthood very early in life um, because you had to undergo a lot of training and do a lot of work to get there. Um, and so it was, it was a very prestigious position. It was also a very important position. Both the people above the knights relied on them for protection and the people below the knights relied on them for protection. 
All right, next thing that we need to address, right, if the medieval romance is tales about knights and chivalry, is what is chivalry? This is a very important theme in medieval literature. Um, and so chivalry is simply the code of moral conduct by which knights were supposed to live. Um, this develops, um, I believe, in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries is when this code of chivalry develops. And it is actually, it, it was in fact kind of a written code of behavior. And I'm going to post um, some documents from a couple different places that uh, show some of what the actual written code was so that you can preview it and look at it and kind of get a feeling for that. I'm also going to post a brief video um, from the Getty Museum about chivalry as well. Um, but it was this code of conduct by which knights were supposed to live. Um, some people think that it may have arisen out of the Crusades um, in response to a recognition of some of the really atrocious behavior that knights were committing during the Crusades. Um, they were uh, not behaving in a Christian manner, killing and raping and all those sorts of things. Um, and so uh, some scholars believe that chivalry may have arisen in a response to those uh, those really atrocious things that were done as a as an ideal for knights to strive toward and say okay this is what you're supposed to behave like not like a barbarian not like a brute who just goes and murders and rapes people but this is the way you're supposed to behave and you can see how some of this code is a response to that um, so one of the most important things of the code of chivalry was that you were supposed to offer your services to God um, Almost all of medieval Europe uh, was openly Christian, and so that was a very important thing. The knight was supposed to be devoted to God first and foremost. Not that all knights were, but that was what they were supposed to be. Um, you were also supposed to absolute, uh, sorry, to exercise absolute loyalty to your Lord, um, and that was uh, a really key element of the chivalric code and is still something that we highly value today. Loyalty is something uh, that is very, very important to us um, and is one of those things that has kind of come down to us through the, through the code of chivalry, through the values of chivalry down through the years. Um, we still value loyalty very highly. Defending and not persecuting the weak. Um, now you can see how this could be a response to some of the things that happened in the Crusades. Of course, there were still people who felt like if uh, if someone wasn't a Christian, you could treat them however you wanted, right? You didn't have to defend them and you could persecute them, um, that this rule only applied to those with inside the Christian faith. Um, nevertheless, this is an important value and is something that we still value today. And we have learned to extend beyond those narrow limitations of the medieval world, right? Uh, we have learned to extend even to those outside our groups. Um, and I would argue um, that the medieval knights had kind of missed the point there, that Jesus very clearly says that we are to treat our enemies this way as well as our friends, right? Um, and so um, this was something they may have missed a little bit, but still is a very important value to defend the weak, to not persecute them, to stand up for those who cannot stand up for themselves. I believe that's a very Christian value. It's something that Jesus would have us to strive for. Um, and it's something that I'm glad has been passed down to us, um, even if the medieval knights didn't get it quite right. Uh, defending and honoring women. This was kind of an unprecedented thing, actually. It was something new in medieval Europe. Um, not that women had achieved the status that they, um, they have achieved today and that they should achieve that position of equality, um, but this was a step in the right direction. It was a step that a lot of prior civilizations had not seen the value of women. And so a lot of people criticize the chivalric code for painting women as weak and needing defending and not being able to stand up for themselves. But you have to keep in mind the context and how things are progressing. This is a step in the right direction, right? Um, prior to this era, women were not really seen as needing to be defended or valued or honored, right? And the woman is really elevated quite a bit because of the code of chivalry. Um, 
you saw one of the guys in the documentary yesterday talk about this sense of kind of this almost reverent relationship between a knight and a woman who's in whose name he did all of his kind of chivalric deeds. Um, and so there was a real sense of honoring of women that didn't exist before. And so although the code of chivalry may not uh, represent everything that we value about women today. It was a very important step in that direction and it was a very new thing. Honoring and protecting one's comrades. There was this kind of code of uh, conduct among your knights, your fellow knights, that you were supposed to honor and protect them. Um, you were supposed to stand up for them in battle. Um, you were not supposed to do anything that would shame them. And so this sense of camaraderie was very was very important. The fact that you were just supposed to seek honor in a good name. You were supposed to be an honorable person and you were supposed to care that others saw you as honorable. Um, and that was in the hope that that would cause you to behave in a good, upright and righteous manner, right? Not that honor and a good name are the most important things in the world, but that by seeking honor and a good name, you would strive to um, become a better person and do good things and make the world a better place rather than a worse place. You were supposed to be polite and courteous in all your conduct. There was this kind of standard of knights and the aristocracy and nobility and kings and so forth that you were supposed to behave in a way that brought honor to yourself and others. So you were just supposed to be polite and courteous to everyone that you encountered. You were also supposed to fight in a fair and honest manner. This is a kind of interesting thing because you go to war, right? Um, and war is kind of this brutal and terrible and horrible thing and yet Europe during the medieval era develops rules for war. Um, they have rules about how war is supposed to be conducted. That's had a huge impact even on us today um, as in more recent years the United States has been fighting um, has been fighting in the Middle East and they've been fighting groups that don't have the same rules for war that we have traditionally held. Um, and a lot of our rules for war come down from the chivalric code. Things like um, not involving civilians, right? Um, not killing the innocent. That's something that comes down to us from chivalry. Um, and, um, and that's something that we still value very much. Like the civilian shouldn't be caught up in the war. The problem is that a lot of the terrorist organizations in the Middle East don't value that. Right? Um, they're perfectly happy to kill civilians along with soldiers. Um, that's part of what they do. And so we are coming from this very traditional standpoint of kind of these rules of battle and of, uh, of war and how all of that is supposed to be run. Um, and we have in more recent years come into conflict with groups that don't value the same thing when it comes to warfare. Um, but chivalry had these kind of fighting in a fair and honest manner. You weren't supposed to kill your enemy while they were down, right? Um, if someone had fallen on the ground, you gave them the chance to get back up and to defend themselves. You didn't stab your enemy in the back, right? Um, where they had no opportunity to defend themselves. Um, and so this, this is a very kind of interesting concept. It was very important to chivalry. It was meant to show that um, again, you were an honorable person and that you honored others, even your enemies. Um, obviously, there might have been a distinction between your enemies that were Christians and your enemies that were Muslims, um, that perhaps the knights should have listened to the message of Jesus a little bit more than they did, right? But still, it was a, a reflection of the sense of honor for all people. Um, now, this doesn't mean that uh, the knights always in reality abided by the code of chivalry in the way that they should. Um, it was more of an ideal, definitely ideal, that appears more in their literature than it probably did in reality. But nevertheless, it was an ideal that was given to them to strive for in reality, right? It was something that knights were supposed to make their goal in reality, not just in literature. Um, with the hope that things would be better because of it. And most likely, 
because of the code of chivalry, things were better. They may not have been perfect, they may not have been the way that we would like to see them, but they were probably better because of this code. So, the medieval romance are tales of knights, their gallant deeds, chivalry, um, and all those sorts of things. That's what the medieval romance is traditionally structured around the idea of the quest. Some of the main characters in the medieval romance were kings, knights, and many times a damsel who was in distress, a damsel who needed some sort of rescuing. Um, oftentimes they involve glamorous portrayals of castle life and medieval life, things like plague and the fact that your toilet was in the same room with your clothes and that you dumped uh, your toilet out the window onto the streets below or into the moat. Uh, from which you fished and got your meal. Uh, but those sorts of things were not things that were really mentioned in the medieval romance. The medieval romance focused on all the kind of glorious, um, illustrious, glamorous parts of castle life, of the medieval life at court, right? They didn't really typically focus on the lives of peasants or lives of the cities. Um, but more on the life of the court and of the nobility and everything that was glamorous about that. The earliest romances were in verse. We mentioned that the French troubadours were, um, were the first people, they were singing poets, right? And they traveled around and sang songs, these long narrative songs, these long extended songs about knights and their great deeds and their quests. And so the earliest romances are in verse, in poetic, Blah, blah, blah. Sorry, in poetic form. Having trouble talking today. Um, sorry about that. Uh, later romances, however, moved into prose. They moved into um, non-poetic terms. And so when we get to one of the latest medieval romances, La Morte d'Arthur by Sir Thomas Mallory, um, it is written entirely in prose. There's no verse lines. There's no poetic structure there. It's written much more like we are used to reading a traditional book. So some key characteristics of the romance. So aside from some of the main characters and what it's generally about, here are some of the important features of medieval romance. Firstly, that it embodies the ideals of chivalry. Obviously, we've been talking about that, but the medieval romance, one of the key themes is that of chivalry and uh, the conflict between chivalry and something else, oftentimes the conflict between chivalry and love. Typically, medieval romances are set in a remote time or place. It's kind of in an anywhere. The country might be mentioned in the Arthurian legends. It does take place in England, in Britain. Um, however, uh, it's usually, even though it's kind of a medieval story, even in medieval terms, it's kind of thought to have taken place a long time ago, once upon a time. That's the kind of idea, right? It's not supposed to have been recent history, but it is uh, history from long ago, um, in the distant past. Also, the place is still somewhat remote as well. Even though the Arthurian stories are set in England, they're set in kind of an ideal um, no place in England. Uh, they're set in Camelot and Avalon and all of these other places that are not real places in England. We can't pinpoint them on a map today. Scholars have tried to figure out where they might have been, um, but we really don't know. And we don't even know if the medieval audiences intended for them to be representative of real places. Um, it's entirely possible that all of these places were fictional. And so they're set kind of in this remote past and in this remote place. Um, oftentimes rank and social distinctions are emphasized, right? Uh, the fact that you are a member of the nobility as a knight or as a duke or a duchess or a king or a queen is very important. And you can see a lot of the kind of traditional societal structures of medieval Europe in the medieval romance. They really emphasize that. They also draw clear lines about how the king is more important than the knights and all these sorts of things. Um, so uh, those, are, those are some very uh, important social themes that exist in the medieval romance. 
there is oftentimes a sense of the supernatural, um, that uh, magic and supernatural exists in the world of the medieval romance. Um, one uh, very old English medieval romance uh, features an a knight who is completely green and gets his head chopped off but is able to pick it up and still talk from his head and write off. Um, and so there's oftentimes a sense of that kind of supernatural element. Um, many of the Arthurian stories feature the characters of Merlin and Morgan Le Fay. Um, and Merlin and Morgan Le Fay are of course a wizard and a witch, right? Um, a sorcerer and a sorceress, and so they have magic abilities. Um, they're oftentimes people who kind of appear supernaturally and disappear. Um, the knights oftentimes have to do supernatural deeds, uh, or sometimes it's divine, right? As in the case of Percival in the Quest for the Holy Grail, a castle that appears and disappears, um, kind of this holy place um, in which you can see holy relics, right? And that's a supernatural element as well. Um, the medieval romance usually presents a hero engaged in an adventure, the idea of the quest, right, that we've talked about already. Um, most often, this is a pure adventure, right, a kind of pure, holy, um, a, uh, an adventure that comes out of a good heart, but it's not always that, as, of course, we see with Lancelot. Typically, love is included as a major plot element. Again, this is not always true, but romantic love is often a key component of the story um, and, and is present um, within the text. Oftentimes, it also features kind of spontaneous, unmotivated fighting. Okay, so like uh, an enemy kind of shows up out of nowhere and challenges the hero to a duel, right, or to a jousting match, or... Uh, to some sort of challenge. And really, they may claim a motivation, but the motivation seems to kind of come out of nowhere. Like a knight may write in and say, I challenge you, King Arthur, to prove that your knights are worthy. Let's fight, right? Um, and so it's just kind of like, what? Why? We shouldn't fight about this in our modern terms. We're just kind of like, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but it's but it's a part of the story, right? Um, and you have to keep in mind that uh, medieval culture was a very war-driven culture, and so the way to prove yourself as honorable was in battle, right? And so in the medieval context, it makes a lot more sense. To us, it just kind of seems kind of like it comes out of nowhere. But that is a key feature of the medieval romance, that this fighting often appears and we don't entirely understand where it comes from. So Arthurian legend, legend in particular, see I told you I can't talk, I stumbled over Merlin and Morgan Le Fay back there, legend, sorry you'll have to forgive me, just one of those days when my mouth is not doing what my brain is telling it to do. So Arthurian legend, Arthurian legend arose out of Breton mythology, as I've already mentioned, that people group um, that was originally from England and had migrated across the English Channel to northern France. And they are tales of King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. Now, originally, medieval romance is not all stories about Arthur and his knights. However, over time, because the Arthur stories proved to be the most popular medieval romances, um, over time, the rest of those medieval romance stories uh, begin to get incorporated into Arthurian legend. And so authors begin to say, oh yeah, this knight who uh, was never really a part of the Arthurian story before, oh yeah, well, they were one of Arthur's knights, right? Um, the, the stories may not have mentioned that in the past, but yeah, Tristan was one of Arthur's knights. Um, or, you know, uh, Eric was one of Arthur's knights. Um, nobody mentioned that, but, but it was true. They were one of the knights of the round table. Um, and so gradually the kind of group of knights who are part of the round table expands so that by the time you get to the end of the medieval era, almost all of medieval romance stories have been incorporated somehow into the Arthurian legend. Um, and almost all of the stories of knights uh, have been grafted into that mythology and the knights have been said to have been knights of Arthur. So 
one of the key kind of conflicts in Arthurian legend is the conflict between love and chivalric duty. And I mentioned earlier about how different knights, even in the works of Cartier de Troyes, deal with that conflict in different ways. Um, Lancelot sacrifices his love and chivalric duty for, sorry, he doesn't sacrifice his love, he sacrifices his honor and chivalric duty for the sake of his love, whereas Yvain sacrifices his love for the sake of his honor. And then Percival finds a perfect binding of uh, God love and chivalric duty in his quest for the Holy Grail. Um, typically, Arthurian legend portrays knights on a variety of quests that has always been an important part of the Arthurian legend. But the Arthurian legend, as you saw in the documentary yesterday, also expands beyond that. And in fact, the documentary yesterday didn't really focus on most of the quests. It talked about the quest for the Holy Grail, but most of it focused on the rest of the story, the part that's not a quest story, the part that's more about Arthur and his family and his relationships. And so that's an important part of Arthurian legend as well. Um, but of the quests, the search for the Holy Grail is, of course, the most popular. Um, and um, it is it is the one that people keep coming back to, and therefore it makes sense. It was the one the documentary included um, as as part of its kind of overview of Arthurian legend. But do rest assured, there are a lot of other quests that are included in the story of Arthurian legend as well. Um, you guys can hear the bells in the lecture, so you know that um, I'm just recording over the gap in a class period. So, all right. So. Yesterday I asked you to take notes on some of the important figures in Arthurian legend, and they will be important ones that we keep coming back to. King Arthur obviously is kind of the figurehead, and he's an important part of much of the story, but there is a, a portion of Arthurian legend that kind of has Arthur as a background figure, and where he's kind of sending knights out on various quests. Um, and that occupies a decent portion of what has become Arthurian legend as well. Queen Guinevere um, is important especially when it comes down to eventually Arthur's kind of downfall um, and her relationship with Lancelot um, and how everything kind of begins to unravel there. Lancelot is obviously an important figure. We talked about how he's an invention of Cleti and de Troyes um, and he uh, brings in a lot of more kind of French ideas um, and he brings in a real problem, right? And he also begins kind of the element of kind of the unraveling of Arthur's kingdom um, through his adulterous relationship with Guinevere, but that doesn't mean he's disloyal to Arthur. And so this is very, he's this very problematic figure. He loves Arthur, he's loyal to Arthur, um, and yet he loves Guinevere and, and can't kind of stop his feelings for her. And it's this, it's this whole mess, right? Um, and it's a real chance to explore that conflict we were talking about, about the conflict between love and chivalric duty and how do you work all of that out. Galahad. Interestingly, uh, Lancelot may be the most impure of the knights because of his adultery with Guinevere, but his son Galahad, not a son by Guinevere, a son by his wife Elaine, um, his son Galahad proves to be the most pure and the most, most holy and the one who eventually uh, comes the closest to actually bringing the Holy Grail back to Arthur's kingdom. He achieves the quest of the Holy Grail. He finds it um, and uh, kind of receives that blessing of a vision of Christ. And so he's a very important figure as well. Um, Mordred, right? Both Mordred and Galahad are kind of symbols that um, that the medieval people didn't believe that the sins of the father followed and haunted the son, right? Um, you see this in that Lancelot is kind of the most impure of knights, and yet Galahad is the most pure. Um, we see this in that King Arthur is the ideal king. He's the most respectable and worthy and honorable king kind of almost kind of in all of British history, right? That's kind of what the legend set him up to be. And yet his son Mordred, who is an illegitimate son, um, does not follow in his father's footsteps at all. He betrays his father. He tries to take his stepmother as his wife. He does all kinds of 
horrific things, right? Um, and so both Galahad and Mordred kind of provide this contrast um, and this idea that kind of each each man's decisions were important, right? Obviously, there's still an element as well of um, Arthur's sins coming back to bite him, right? He had a relationship outside of wedlock um, that resulted in the birth of Mordred. Um, and uh, that relationship, he didn't know it, but was, what, but was with one of his half-sisters. Um, and so that causes a whole new level of things. So there's there's multiple ideas that the medieval people are toying with in the stories of Galahad and Mordred. Galahad kind of seems to suggest that like, just because the father was a bad person doesn't mean that the son was a bad person. Kind of each person can choose his or her own destiny. Um, but Mordred also kind of, uh, he represents that just because the father was a good person doesn't mean that the son will be a good person. He also represents the fact that sin will come find you out in the end, right? Like it will come back to bite you, and that the medieval people have a strong belief in that. Merlin is an important figure. He serves as a guide and a mentor to Arthur. He kind of sets things up, and he seems to be kind of trying to set up a particular kind of kingdom uh, as he as he guides Arthur to becoming king. All right, so lastly we have Morgan Le Fay. Um, she's one of the chief antagonists in the Arthurian legend, um, and her primary motivation is um, because she is upset about what Arthur's father did to her father and her mother, um, and that's why she's mad at her half brother Arthur. Arthur is her half brother. Um, they both have the same mother, um, but she's she's upset with Arthur and she wants to take him down largely because of what his father did. Um, and so she is uh, one of the primary antagonists and she's behind a lot of the machinations of Mordred and what he's doing. Although in some early versions, she's actually just kind of a benevolent figure. Um, it's She doesn't really become kind of a wicked witch until uh, later in the development of the legends. And that is something that's important to remember about these legends is that they're not static and they never have been. So there's there's no standard version of the story, right? There's no like, this is the one way that the Arthur story goes. Every time it's retold, it's told a little bit differently. And so from the first retellings of it to even modern retellings of it, everything shifts a little bit here and there and things change, which is one of the reasons why I really enjoy watching or reading different versions of the Arthur story simply because um, every time that it's redone, people feel free to make their own changes to it, as they should, because people have been doing that ever since these stories were first told. Um, so every version is just a little bit different, though there are some similar plot elements and there are some similar things in each and every retelling. Of course, the Knights of the Round Table are really important in Arthurian legend as well. Um, and so Morgan Le Fay was the last one we talked about as far as one single character. But the Knights of the Round Table are this group of knights. And I think the full list of knights would be even longer than this, but these are some of the most well-known. Um, Sir Bedivere, who uh, proves to be very important early on in the story and very late in the story, he's kind of one of the last most faithful knights to Arthur when Arthur is dying. Um, Sir Ector, who is Arthur's kind of adopted father, Arthur is, uh, as, as you know, he was taken away um, from Uther and Egraine uh, when he was a baby, as you saw in the documentary yesterday, um, and Ector raised him kind of as his own son. Uh, Sir Kay, who is Arthur's adopted brother, um, we talked about Galahad, um, Sir Gareth and Sir Gawain. Gawain proves to be one of the uh, most loyal and faithful knights to Arthur as well. And he is he's subject of his own adventures, his own quest stories, as we've been talking about. Um, uh, then Lancelot, of course, Lionel, Mordred, Percival, uh, Tristan, who is uh, part of a very tragic love story, a sort of Romeo and Juliet-esque story that appears in the medieval era. It's not exactly the same, but it has some similar plot elements. Um, and then Ewain or Ewain as well. So um, this 
for about this next week, um, I'm going to be posting a number of things to do with the story Lancelot, the Knight of the Cart by Chrétien de Troyes. Um, that's going to be the first medieval work that we're reading. And we're going to kind of, uh, we're, we're going to look at Lancelot first, who's uh, a really good example of the medieval quest story, and um, it is a really good um, kind of overall introduction to medieval romance. It has many of the traditional features, um, but of course doesn't show us the most ideal of knights. And then later we'll read some of Percival, which will show us a much more kind of ideal situation for a knight, um, something um, uh, that is much more pure and honorable in his, uh, in his quest, someone who's much more pure and honorable in his quest. Um, and so we will take a look at that a little bit later. So we'll look kind of at both sides that Chrétien de Troyes uh, explores. He explores both of those and, and that conflict between love and duty and how Lancelot compromises on that and how, um, how Percival finds kind of the perfect harmony of them. So we're going to be looking at Lancelot. I'm going to be posting uh, a PDF of, um, of Lancelot, the Knight of the Cart for you to read. It's a little bit lengthy, which is why I'm giving you a pretty good span of time to work on it. In addition to that, I'm going to have a um, kind of a Kahoot review on this Kahoot, it'll, on this Kahoot, on this PowerPoint and this lecture. Um, we'll have a Kahoot review on that um, that will uh, go over some of the information. It'll be set up as a Kahoot challenge, so you can retry it multiple times if you want. Um, so you'll be able to do that. Um, I will probably have a couple discussion boards up about Lancelot, the Knight of the Cart, and ask you to chime in before the time is up. And then there will be a few questions to answer um, to just submit as an assignment as well. I think I will also uh, include as one of those uh, discussion posts a short video about chivalry. So. Um, make sure to take a look at all the assignments that are upcoming for Lancelot, the Knight of the Cart. Make sure that you have access to the PDF. Um, if you have any problems accessing any of the things for this next segment, feel free to call me or email me. Um, reach out to me. Um, you can send me a message directly on Canvas or you can send it to my email. But feel free to reach out if you've got any questions or need any help. I'd be happy to help you guys out. And I hope you guys enjoy this first work that we're going to be reading um, and enjoy the discussion with one another as, um, as you're reading it. So have a good day, guys.